It would be a mistake to underestimate Sarah Palin. Her swift rise to prominence is perhaps the 2008 Republican uh, candidacy's most lasting legacy. While some observers write her off as a temporary sideshow, Howard Feynman of Newsweek commented that Palin is, quote, the big winner in the campaign and predicted she has entered national politics to stay. However, th though Governor Palin's credentials to be vice president are minimal, her credentials for that campaign, which was all about tapping sacred cultural icons and going for the gut, were impeccable. Like Ann Coulter, Nancy Grace, and other harsh female spokespersons for neoliberal and neoconservative politics, Palin is a somewhat more affable face of what some scholars have characterized as a, a certain kind of political style. Palin's jabbing index finger, jutting jaw, relentless animation, and amiable smirk sculpt her embodied presence as urgent, her message as alarming. Feminist theorist Elizabeth Janeway called, recalled once uh, that, or excuse me, predicted once that the first woman to make it to the White House would be a vice president picked for balance who was a conservative Republican who believes in the status quo. Janeway was right. While feminists have argued over whether Palin is or is not a feminist, they have warned of the dangers of her policies for women, and they have assessed her treatment in the media. These are not, I argue, the most important questions that feminism needs to pick up with regard to Sarah Palin. Far more crucial is what I'm going to call, quoting a philosopher, Michel Foucault, the Palin effect. The way that her presence becomes a kind of generality by extending itself across a political surface, in this case, the surface of US conservative evangelical politics. Palin serves as a potent relay point in a conservative ideological apparatus. Traits that appear to be specific to her, her speech, her sexuality, her smile, are able to rise to prominence due to their imbrication, which means their integration. They're like sewn into a, a network of elements whose interactions produce, not merely record, her appeal. A sign held by a man at the pre-election Alaskan Women Reject Palin rally in Anchorage read, Bush in a skirt. Palin is Bush and drag. Palin, like McCain and Bush, is another true believer in American empire. Palin was willing during the campaign to link the 9-11 attacks with the war in Iraq, which even <coughs> President Bush had ceased to allege by that time. In her debate with Biden, Palin heralded the imminent US victory in Iraq, associating it with the claim that McCain knows how to, quote, win wars, and failing to note that the war he fought in was not, in fact, one that we won. In her acceptance speech, Palin correctly noted that it is the sons and sometimes daughters of the rural working class who fight America's wars, along with the sons and daughters of minority communities, but that is a kinship that Palin declines to explore. Like no male candidate could do, Palin parlayed her small town patriotism into er ignorant cheerleading for America's failed war in Iraq, recruiting enduring national loyalties to justify sending still more young men and young women to the, to the brutal mayhem of an unnecessary war. How does this work? For help in understanding how Palin's candidacy worked for those who find her compelling, I turn to a philosopher with a fabulous last name, well, whole name, Slavoj Zizek, and his analysis of ideology. Zizek points out a triangulated relationship. That means if you think of it as three points of a triangle, the causal arrows go around in both directions all the time. Everything is related to everything else. There's not a single cause and effect relationship. And the three that he points out to us, these ideas that are, <coughs> carry a lot of weight because they're vague and thus they can work in many ways, the sublime ideological disidentification and jouissance. The sublime is that which inspires awe, veneration, a feeling of boundlessness that can issue in both delight and fear. And the way that she's actually using it actually comes from the philosopher Kant. And some of the um, examples he gave were a towering mountain range, a hurricane, a powerful earthquake, an experience that goes beyond beauty to awesome greatness. It inspires in us both delight and fear. It gives a feeling of boundlessness. The big other is either the symbolic order itself, or in this case, an individual who can stand for all that. That person who can, not so much because of her own individuality, but because of her place in this order of meaning, is able to serve as that operant um, nodal point. The big other um, is a kind of condensed site of meaning. Second of is Zizek's ideas here is what he calls, this is the mouthful, ideological disidentification. A process that enables people to maintain a distance from the things that they actually espouse. 
And the point of this is the argument that any ideology generates excess. That is, no matter what, ex what philosophical view you're looking at, can account for everything. Stuff doesn't fit. Okay, the third in the trio of concepts, remember what this trio does, each one is both the cause and effect of all the others. The third concept is jouissance, the excessive pleasure that goes beyond ordinary enjoyment, embodies rapture, and can lead to pain. It is an erotic, transgressive passion, excessive, irrational, and it accounts for the hold of ideologies on us. So part of Zizek's argument here is if we want to understand how ideologies work, we have to understand what people love. It's about love. It's about passion. <clears throat> The idea of over-the-top enjoyment can be both sexual and appropriative. It signifies extreme or deep pleasure, it can mean sexual orgasm, and in the law, it signifies having the right to use something. Palin's campaign was a site for complex transactions of jouissance. Palin's appeal among dudes, men sporting proud to vote for a hot chick button or carrying governor's I'd like to fuck signs, was an obvious site for a mischievous kind of juvenile jouissance in which ogling an attractive woman in public is compatible with supporting her politically. Polls suggest that support for Palin's candidacy during the campaign was strongest among men who predominated at her rallies. That's, by the way, starting to change. Her support now seems to be stronger among women. While young white guys with maverick painted on their bare, depolated chests provide an eye-catching performance of juvenile jouissance, more interesting were the, media, were the relations Palin sustained with the male power holders in Republican circles, relations mediated through a back and forth over that erotically charged commodity, the approval of powerful men. The face of feminism that insists primarily on upward mobility for women within existing institutions can, not surprisingly, readily be paired with any institution, including the Republican Party. Ironically, McCain proclaimed that Palin is, quote, a direct counterpart to the liberal feminist agenda for America, when it is precisely the thinnest aspect of liberal feminism that Palin has tapped. But there is much more work for feminism to, to do. Supporters of Palin can pride themselves on their open-mindedness in giving women a chance to lead because, I think, they have not yet thought very much about the direction this leadership would, has taken or would take for people such as themselves, for non-elite women and men. Just as many African Americans and Latino Americans struggling against racism were appalled at the political successes of conservatives Clarence Thomas and Alberto Gonzalez, many more women, including evangelical women, may come to see that Palin's environmental, economic, and military policies, which reproduce those of the Bush administration in almost every respect, are disastrous for them. Feminists and other progressives could seek to build a new political assembly to develop a resonance between religious sensibilities and critical political practices. There is already a pluralization within conservative Christianity. There's already a range of people in positions. It, they sent us their worst one. <laughs> Environmental, indigenous, and feminist openings for possible alliances can be uh, sought. Feminists can intervene in these restless spaces, working for a reordering that could erode the appeal of candidates such as Sarah Palin.